So today, firstly, I want to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners we are the country living on, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and uh, welcome everyone here in Perth who made it in person, and greetings over to Adelaide. So um, my talk is more around um, basin analysis, giving you a bit of an insight of what it means and how it provides you a framework for discovery. The, uh, as you know, the sedimentary basins take up a, lot, a large amount of um, space in Australia. But then if you look at the actual mines and workings, as you see on that map with the dots, uh, the basins are a bit uh, neglected in that point. And it comes down to it's really difficult to explore, as you all know. The, so how can we improve that? And how can we go about it to um, find more the, uh, discoveries in basins? So what is basin analysis? Um, so in general, you would say it's the formation and evolution of sedimentary basins. And that includes understanding their provenance, understanding the sequence stratigraphic framework. And we all throughout the day will uh, talk about some of the components. Then understanding the deposition environment, tectonic architecture is crucial. Um, we also need to know a bit about the geochemistry or chemistry stratigraphy. Diagenesis is really important. And then that whole picture gives you sort of an idea of the basin evolution and how that relates to where you actually have your mineralization. As we are working in basins, of course, we're going back to the petroleum mineral systems because that's the best well-established approach. And you know, the petroleum system approach is being adapted to mineral systems. However, it's still not really that straightforward applicable. So in, you know, in petroleum mineral systems, you have your source, you have your um, reservoir rocks, you understand the basin evolution, you got a with going with depth and temperature, you know where you pass through your oil and gas window, you're through, you're not gonna have any hydrocarbons if you're sitting within it spot on. So it's it's relatively straightforward in that sense in terms of understanding that whole system. But how do we do we actually understand that in basins? Like we know we have syngenetic, diagenetic, epigenetic mineralization. When where does this the sweet spot in the basin formation where we actually have those those deposits forming and all these uh, source. And we have the the other difficulty of not really knowing where the source of the metals is, if it's a, a mafic basalt from a basement or is it some intraformational uh, leaching of, of sandstones. So if you look at the basin mineral systems in a bit of a different way, for in this case, the sediment hosted stratovan copper, you could probably argue around, you could add some components, you could take some off. You might say, oh, that's wrong from what we know, but that's the problem. Like there's so many different ways of explaining it. And one of the most important things is you got to understand the evolution of your source or uh, aquifer, and you need to understand the evolution of your host. If they're both not fitting the criteria, then you're already short on one of the mo most crucial components. In order to go there, I'm not going to go in detail on that, but in order to go there, first, the easiest is to look at your regional architecture. So that's an example from the MacArthur Basin. So you're mapping using our various, various tools, geophysical interpretation, stratigraphic correlation, and so on. And you're capturing a picture of what the basin architecture looks, looks like, but it's now. So you don't actually know which of the faults have been active or have been the fluid uh, pathways during the time of mineralization. So you almost have to, if, if it's a complex basin, you really need to figure out when is the timing of the mineralization, what are the deformation processes during that time, which faults were active, which were the ones that were that allowed fluid flow and which ones didn't. So without that, it's really hard to predict where you might have your exploration target. And then of course, if you do have a deposit or an occurrence, understanding that in more detail, that's an example from an MVT deposit where we know it's like a late overprinting phase where you def look at all the microstructures from thin section scale up to deposit scale, understand your deformation history, and then figure out where the mineralization fits into that structural framework. So once we understand or think to understand structural framework, 
at the present time. We also have to figure out what might have been the structures back in the past during the sedimentation. And in that case, we are looking at the depositional environments. That's the work done by Marcus, who's here, um, where we basically look at drill cores. You might not have as many available. So in this case, you see all these little gray dots on the map on the left. Those are the drill holes. And you kind of creating an image of what the basin might have looked like during the deposition of that particular unit. And the reason why it works is because, the, as you know, the depositional environment defines where we are in rel relatively to basement, basin, shoreline, and so on. And it gives you a sort of a clue where you might have had your active tectonism at the time, or um, you understand the, the fault generations during extension and then can translate it into later uh, compressional events. So what you need for defining your um, potential source or aquifer is understanding the deposition environment and the structural architecture. We can then go look in a bit more detail in the actual core. And that's an example from the Amadeus Basin where you understand the different deposition environments it gives you a clue by the paleoclimate, which we know with, if we want saline brines in a the basin, they're usually from evaporites. So you got to uh, figure out if you're actually in the right space. But the other important thing in this is also to figure out what are your rocks, do your rocks have the right permeability porosity, but also connectivity. So understanding bedding angles and pinch outs and all these sedimentary structures could be, become quite important in terms of um, transport of your of fluid migration in general, and then also find where which one could be your aquifers, which one could be your seals. So looking at all these things uh, tells you about the hydraulic regime during the time of deposition of those sediments, but subsequently uh, hint towards mineralization or at any point in in um, during the basin history. If we go to the basin history, or let's say burial history, in regards to mineralization, there are mechanisms we well they are well understood when what happens to a sediment during a uh, burial. So you start off with on the left side is a classic uh, depth porosity plot for different uh, rock compositions. You always start with the mechanical compaction, which is just reorientation of grains as the dominant. Um, component. And then eventually, once you get through a temperature window under normal geothermal gradient, you get into chemical compaction, which means it's the real, um, you could call it burial diagenesis or mesodiagenesis, where you start having mineral reactions happening from the detrital grains because of, of pressure solution. And I'll show you an example in a minute what that means in terms of aquifer and um, host. So it, I just put that up because it's sort of, if you imagine you have your model of when you think your mineralization happened based on your structural observations and um, maybe you have some petrographic data, you could then say, okay, we've got a mineralization around, if you have fluid inclusion data, it's helpful too, uh, that is around 120 degrees on the right. This is not a real example, it's just sort of superimposed on that. Um, time of mineralization, what would the porosity permeability be of your aquifer and your host to actually get the fluids into that system and without any chemical reactions happening at that time, just the general um, parameters. But permeability is also important if you're talking about horizontal or lateral permeability, in especially in shales. So in, in this example, you see, you could say, okay. And then the other important component is how, how much deeper is your aquifer compared to your uh, host? Because if they're like two or three kilometers apart, you're already talking about another um, degree of compaction for one or the other. So you've got to figure out, are you targeting the burial depth and the, the best porosity permeability for the aquifer or source, or are you targeting that for the, uh, the shale that's usually above? The, um, so in this case, you, you see the source and aquifer in, the, in that example would be, you would look something like 
depth of five kilometers, but your um, porosity is down to 15%. It's not that bad. Um, and it also plays a role of what diagenet diagenetic minerals you have. And then, but the host has a, it's going down to quite low por uh, porosities and permeability. So you got to look at both of those things in, in terms of seeing if you have a chance of, of mineralization to occur, of fluid flow to occur. And that's all assuming you have already identified your source of the metals and your fluid pathways and your structures that, that might have carried them. So I want to touch a bit more on the diagenesis because it's it's in basins probably the most problematic um, problematic point when you might have all the other ingredients, but diagenesis might be the one that is not helping or it is helping. I have so for the the source or aquifer. Let's assume we have a sandstone or a feldspathic sandstone. Um, it's good porosity. If you have, and I'll show you two different, so it doesn't necessarily, if you have low porosity, it doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean it's not reactive. So on the left, you see this, it's a thin section scale of arcosic sandstone, immature sandstone, and it's the yellow bits, it's that's calcite cement. So it's been cemented up so that if you calculate the the yellow bits, it's probably like 30-40% of the sample, which means it's, and you see the grains floating into in that calcite matrix. So that usually means it's being calcite cemented very early in the basin formation due to evaporation. So that's like early diagenetic, it happens pretty much straight after deposition, blocks all the porosity and it's it's sealed. So there's nothing happening. However, if you have the right fluids going, hitting that, that calcite cemented sandstone at depth, and you wouldn't have much compaction because it's already uh, as compacted as you can get it. So if you hit, if you have the right fluids hitting that calcite cement, cemented sandstone with a mineralizing fluid, you can get a dissolution going. So you're actually creating secondary porosity, which might help you to get your, your um, deposit forming at that time. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to have a, a, a highly cemented um, host in the, in the beginning. Conversely, if you have a clean sandstone, which is quartz aronite or something, fluvial sandstone, beautiful porosity, usually in hydrocarbon systems, it's um, the 25% porosity, perfect res gas reservoir. If you bury that and you get into the chemical compaction uh, zone, you're compressing the quartz grains against each other, and that's causing quartz cementation. And the quartz cementation fills up the pores. On that right top pic picture, you see all the blue stuff, that's the porosity. <laughs> all the, the tridal grains are the light gray, and then the cements are the darker gray. So you see, you, 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 if you, haven't, you, know, if you have, haven't had any mineralization up to that point, and that usually happens around, it starts around 90 degrees, uh, quartz cementation, and then it continues going on until about 150 burial depth. Um, so you're blocking all your pores. You will not, will not have any connectivity. So there's no way of getting any later fluids through that system. It's not going to be your aquifer. So just keep that in mind if you see a, a sandstone. Really make sure you understand the diagenetic history. The third example is when you have one of those dirty lithic arcosic sandstones that have a lot of feldspar, a lot of lith lithic fragments. They usually also come with a, a clay coating around the quartz grain because it's just the nature of how they form. They, they're much better. They have good porosity, but because they have this K feldspar component, K feldspar cements, they, it grows really early, um, early temperatures, and it's easily dissolved at the same time. So you, you're creating, you have a good primary porosity, but you also have an excellent secondary porosity. And you can apply the same principle to your host if you have a feldspathic host or lots of feldspar cement in your host because it has a lot of volcanic components. Um, that secondary porosity is again, very crucial for mineralizing processes if it's, if it's sort of an epigenetic system. So now I'll go talk a little bit about the uh, host sequence. So, on the left, you see it's just a really old plot, but it, it pretty much sums it up where you have your 
range of deposition environments from fluvial to uh, marine on the top block diagram. And underneath it, you see the different behaviors of the early cement, early clay minerals on the detrial grains, and then what happens during um, diagenesis. So depending what clay minerals you have early on defines what type of clay minerals you have later on. So if you have um, a lot of magnesium iron in the system, you form in chloride cement or chloride later on. If you have um, just hematite, smectite, monmolinite, you will form elite. So, and then again, it's a very different, not talking about the, the organic components, but it's a very different path it takes in terms of uh, alteration later on. And in an example where it shows how important it is to understand the diagenetic history is from HYC from uh, Sam Springs published it just this year with, so you see the fantastic um, bending of pyrite, sphalerite, and the sphalerites replacing carbonate cements. If you wouldn't have had that carbonate cement in the first place, you wouldn't have had um, the sphalerite being able to replace that. So it's, it's under, it's a, that's why it's important to understand the whole history of what's happening. So how do we, what do we use to, to what tools do we have apart from the classic get a sin section, figure out what's going on, but then it means you already have to have a hole where you think your target is. So it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. But there are tools where you can simulate um, or starting to develop tools where you can simulate um, what happens in deformation, what happens stratigraphically. And it's not there yet, but you can do reactive transport modeling where you, you, you can simulate um, mineral reactions at the same time. I'll just show you a little example of what the, uh, the team here has been working on, Thomas Poulet and others, where, so you have your, your fault network defining which faults you think were the ones that were active during time of mineralization and deposition. And then you can build a stratigraphic model based on the, the few information you have of what fuzzies you might um, develop based on the basin architecture. And then if you take that together, you can simulate a fluid flow of where would the fluids gone through in terms of your aquifer, your faults, and then where would it migrate into? Would it actually be capable of migrating into the host you think it is? Um, it's a lot of, it's not a perfect tool in terms of telling you exactly where to drill, but you can test scenarios of where you think, is it even possible to have that as a, as a source or aquifer? And do you have that as a host with that fault architecture you have? Is that is that feasible that you would have those kind of mechanisms going on? So in the end, I summarize of all the challenges that, that I put out there, which is pretty much predict the probability of the timing that you think demonization happens. Um, and for that, do you really understand the, the sequence stratigraphy, the basin architecture, the diagenesis, fluid migration, timing of mineralization, and the whole basin mineral system? Because it's not as simple as um, we all think. So from going back to the Stuart shelf on the components that um, we do together with uh, Carmen and Adrian and Jesus A, so we currently, I'll just show you a little slide in the end, um, what we do currently up to in the Stuart shelf. So we are focusing on the geophysical component because first we've got to figure out which geophysical method works the best for mapping the depth, the basement, the Pandora formation, and then also the stratigraphy within. So this is like really early um, layers of using all these different techniques. We also use MT for that to just figure out how can we map the current the current architecture very early on before you even um, have a target. And then Carmen will tell us a bit more about progress in the on the sequence stratigraphy to really understand that, that that major framework in order to then do your basin analysis. Thank you.